102.5 FM, KXSFLP, San Francisco, and KXSF.FM. You're tuned in to Spark, informing minds, inspiring ideas, igniting innovation. Let the conversation sink into your soul. This is Kelly Marlowe, host of Spark. Today I'm talking with Sharon Miller, CEO of Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center that has helped over 30,000 lower income people become entrepreneurs. We will be talking about the impact of Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center's nonprofit work and how lower income entrepreneurs can survive in today's economic climate. Thank you for joining me today, Sharon. Oh, thank you so much. How do you define lower income entrepreneurs? Who are they and what are their demographics? We use the housing and urban development or HUD definition to determine if people are low income. Each county in the Bay Area varies, but overall it's about an income of $55,000 for one person. Anything $55,000 or below is considered lower income. And why is the focus on lower income entrepreneurs versus highly skilled entrepreneurs? So Renaissance is a nonprofit organization. We're mission-based, and our goal is to create economic opportunity for people who don't necessarily have the same access to business training or capital. So we do work with predominantly lower-income people. We work with women. We work with people of color. We work with people with disabilities, and our goal is really to try to serve people who don't necessarily have that MBA or a huge network of support. It sounds like, from what I've seen and read, that many of your entrepreneurs may not even have a college degree. Is that correct? Yes, the majority do not. Okay. So a best high school degree, and yes. they're learning really or acquiring their skills from on-the-job training. Yes, they have. Um, Most of them, you know, many of them, um, we serve English and Spanish-speaking people. Many also do not speak English as their first language. Mm. And they have thrived and started their own business here? They have. You know, our entrepreneurs have a tremendous amount of drive and grit, and they They really believe in what they're doing, and they work super hard. So it sounds like it's about hard work, discipline, and drive that has enabled them to succeed? Yes. They they also have a, a product or service that is a value that people in the marketplace want. But they have barriers, right, such as not being English speaking or not knowing how everything works and navigating through the paperwork and so on. Well, you know, all of our clients do face these different barriers and language capabilities is, of course, enormous, Um, not having sufficient capital for immigrants, not necessarily knowing how to do business in the United States. These are huge barriers. And that's where Renaissance comes in, is to help them navigate through all these barriers. We do help them navigate through the barriers, and we're also doing more than that, because we are teaching people business skills so that when they take our programs, they really do have the hard and soft skills of business. We're helping people to build networks, and we're helping them to access resources, so whether it's capital or markets or other kinds of information that they need. We are a full-service entrepreneurial community. So let's start with capital. How are you helping them navigate the capital aspect, which is the most important aspect? Yes, it is, of course, very important. It's it's something that's very hard for lower-income people, people who might have poor credit. Um, So... Our, our focus is, first of all, helping people to really bootstrap their businesses. How can you start this business with the least amount of money and the lowest amount of risk? So people are working full and part-time jobs while they're starting their businesses. They're, they're taking smaller steps. Um, if you have a lot of capital, you can often dive in and get started. Our businesses don't have that flexibility. 
They also have um, a much harder time if they don't succeed. They, they can't turn around and say, okay, we tried that. We'll try something else. So we're very cautious in helping people to get loans, but we do. We help people to get loans primarily through nonprofit loan funds and also through crowdsourcing, private sourcing, and their own money whenever possible. Starting businesses generally with less than $50,000. In some cases, far less than $50,000. So it sounds like we, they have to succeed the first time then because they have this one shot. Well, it, it depends. They are starting small, so it might they, they might not be accessing capital for quite a while. So, um, you know, they're, they're taking small steps to get started. But our programs really help people to think through their business ideas So ideally, they're doing a lot of that experimentation before they launch their businesses. You help them with a business plan. You make sure it's vetted, right, in the sense that all the questions and problems and challenges that may come up, that they're able to address them? Yes. We we have a number of different programs that take people through um, introductory idea feasibility, to business planning, and then we have a whole lot of services beyond that. So at the business planning stage, people are in a class with their peers. They get tremendous feedback from the instructors as well as their fellow entrepreneurs, and then they make presentations throughout the class. They practice their elevator pitches. They do a marketing pitch. We bring in people to give feedback on their marketing pitches. And then their business plans are reviewed, and they have follow-up consultations after the business plan is written. So there's really a lot of interaction throughout the process. And how do you help them get to market with their product? We, we start by helping them to really determine who is their target market. And, and sometimes, like many entrepreneurs, they love their products. They come in and think, everybody wants this. You know, everybody wants my cupcakes. And we really help them to figure out, well, it's probably not everybody. You know, who can you reach and who's going to buy this product? So there's a lot of emphasis on, on defining your product. We teach people to conduct interviews so they can get customer feedback and have those interviews with people who aren't only their friends and family who love them. So how do you get outside of your comfort zone and say, and get feedback from someone else. One of our entrepreneurs was making some clothing and she had a very complicated aspect of how you could buy it and make a contribution while you made it and get another contribution if somebody gave it to someone else. And, you know, it sounded really beautiful, but I was one of the people who she interviewed and it was like, this is just too complicated. You know, it sounds great. How can you simplify this? So we try to give people feedback that is valuable and meaningful and can connect them with their target market. Mm, So it's not just about having a great idea or product, but you have to be able to execute and reach the people who will be interested. Exactly. And determine what price point not only gives you a profit, but what price point someone is going to buy your product for. You know, if you turn around and you make the most delicious, fabulous cupcakes in the world and then find out you need to sell them for $10 each, like, do you know people who are going to buy $10 cupcakes? And if you do, how many of them will buy them and how often? So it's it's really perfecting that balance. We, we also are able to provide sales opportunities to people. Um, whether it's caterers, we introduce them to corporations and other businesses who might like to use their catering. We have marketplaces when people have the opportunity to sell their products directly to the public as well. So it sounds like you not only provide them with the training that they may not have acquired through education or skills um, such as marketing, and you also provide the avenues where they can actually apply them. We do. 
We do. And uh, it's not a tremendous part of our program, but we, we try to create these opportunities for people and connect them. There are a number of ventures, venues throughout the Bay Area that we're you know, trying to connect to as well. What is the biggest barrier for your entrepreneurs to overcome in the program? Um, understanding their financials. For the most part, people are really um, very passionate about their ideas. They love their product or their services. That's why they're there. They generally have had this idea of starting a business for years, so it's not a foreign concept to them. But um, um, people get uncomfortable when it's really time to do the math behind the business. And many people say, well, I don't like financials. I I will add that um, about 75% of the people we serve are women, and women are really, really challenged by this sometimes. And they'll say, like, well, I'll have a bookkeeper. I don't like numbers. Someone else will do this. And at some point, you will have a bookkeeper. But you have to know your financials, and there's a really big emphasis on understanding the numbers and understanding them at break even, at profitability, and then understanding all of the financial reporting you need to do. And what so, it means for your business, for you, and exactly, and planning wise. Exactly. And one of the things I'm really proud of is that we do have business owners who have said, you know, when I started the program, I really didn't like financials. Now I love them. I love looking at my numbers. I love knowing what they are. And and that's that's a real breakthrough for people that this is a business and it is important that you are going to create something that will support yourself and your family. So it's we we have to give both kinds of encouragement, like, yes, move forward, and yes, move forward in a profitable way. Is the fear from not being able to do math well, or is it just not being familiar with how you should look at your business from a number standpoint? You know, that's a great question, because I think it's a little bit of both, you know, and um you know, I think when people are learning math, at some point there's that, just that aha moment when all sorts of things come into place, but building up to it can be a challenge. So some of it is, you know, people not having to use that kind of math in their life on a daily basis, so it's it's really not top of mind. And then there is the fear, because that's when the business really starts to feel very real and you know, what if you do all this work and then you realize, well, I'm not going to make any money at it? You know, that can be devastating. So I think it gets complicated. And many people who have come to our programs have made their product before or even delivered their services. So um, if if you have been baking those cupcakes and delivering them to your friends, you know what the ingredients are, you know how to bake them. Maybe you're challenged by saying, okay, I need to ramp up production 10 times. That's not as difficult as as really looking, well, how much will people pay me? How much, you know, what are my fixed costs? What are my additional costs? And making sure that you don't leave anything out. When you're doing something as a hobby, it's really okay that you don't count for your time or count for your mileage making deliveries or, you know, you You couldn't buy everything wholesale, so this costs more, that costs more. But once the business, those things really need to change. It sounds like it's hand-in-hand. You actually have to know what you're doing, what you're building, and you have to know how that's going to transfer in terms of dollars that you can bring in that's going to help you break even and make it into real business. Exactly. Mm, That's not easy. So what about financing? It's not easy to apply for financing, especially if you don't have capital or you don't have the experience, right, prior experience of running a business. It's always a catch-22. It's like, have you had a prior experience running a business before we give you capital? Well, you know, fortunately in the Bay Area, there are a number of places where people can access capital. 
uh, Renaissance clients are very, very rarely getting bank loans. They're not, they don't fit the requirements. It's usually three years in business. It's collateral and our businesses aren't there yet. So, so people can access these nonprofit loan funds that have criteria that allow for small businesses to get started. So they have low collateral requirements, if any. They will support individuals who are new to business, and they they really work with clients. On our end, we curate these different loan products for our clients. So there might be one loan product that goes to seven years, but you just got a 10-year lease. So we're going to connect you with the loan product that is 10 years or um, uh, credit as, as we were talking about, is an issue, and we help people to clean up their credit and take very active steps to improve their credit scores and um, clean up any problems that they may have in the past. We, we also connect people to bankers so that they can have professional bank accounts and can show that they have a history and they are paying their bills and using, you know, separating their business capital from their family income and and operating in a more sophisticated way. And we also help people with the business projections. And that's something that the lenders require. And we will work with people to think through their financial projections as well as how they're going to pay back. That is a service we provide. Well, these are just as important lessons for highly skilled entrepreneurs. So yeah. everybody needs to know this. If you're going to run a business or realize your idea, the it, it seems like in current climate, financing climate, this is where they need to go as well, that the commercial banks are not really there for the small businesses, especially the entrepreneurs in or in this particular cohort or at the center? Yes, it is true for small businesses at large. Um, but again, our focus is really on um, serving people who don't have that access. So we're, we are looking at lower income people. And there are other ways that small businesses can get help um, through consultants directly. Hmm, that's good to know. We're going to take a quick break and thank our underwriters. Be back on Working with Lower Income Entrepreneurs with Sharon Miller. Keep real radio alive, people. Live, local, real radio. That's why you're here listening to KXSF, right? On 102.5 FM San Francisco. We give you more of what you want. Music and programming curated by actual human beings who live locally in your neighbourhoods plus live music and interviews with local artists and bands. But to stay on the air, KXSF really needs your help. Donate now to KXSF by going online to www.kxsf.fm and clicking on Donate. It's 100% tax deductible. Keep real radio alive in San Francisco and donate now, everyone. Thank you so much. This is KXSF 102.5 FM, streaming worldwide at www.kxsf.fm. And you're tuned in to Spark with Kelly Marlowe. Informing minds, inspiring ideas, igniting innovation. Let the conversation sink into your soul. I was talking with Sharon Miller before the break about empowering lower income entrepreneurs. What are the ingredients that have enabled the entrepreneurs to succeed? Is it resilience, family support? What are those key ingredients? Um, Resilience is huge. Family support, community support is, is super important. I mean, we've seen a number of businesses who start because they might be selling their, their products at their churches and they, you know, get their communities really interested in what they're doing. Um, but having a broad supportive network is really important. You know, that same kind of um, place that you can talk to somebody who can give you guidance, who can give you encouragement, and, and share ideas. I would say that overall it is that resiliency that is number one that will keep people in business. So 
having that desire to keep moving forward because you know you're you're going to face hard times. There's you're going to people aren't going to like what you're selling or you're going to have a bump in the road or you're like right now have some difficult times making ends meet. So so really ha- believing in the business itself is so important and having that love not only for your product or your service but having that love for business like really being excited by the interaction and the way that um, you're in charge and you're earning the income directly how much time would you advise your entrepreneurs to work on their business idea before you advise them to walk away oh you know that really depends on the state that people come to us, you know, when they, they come to Renaissance. Um, some people have a lot of experience. We also work with people who have businesses, but they need help maximizing those businesses. So I think it probably takes anywhere from three months to 18 months to be able to start the business. And for many people, it's just having that clear idea working out all of the different obstacles, having a plan to move forward, and and raising enough money to get started in business. It's very possible that your business won't be earning revenues for three to six months, so having that reserve is key as well. So giving yourself enough time to put all those ingredients together. So you have to be super motivated to, super see, motivated. You have to see it through. Yes. Well, besides guidance from the Renaissance Entrepreneur Center, you mentioned resilience, and hopefully you have some kind of support and some kind of capital would make a huge difference. Would you say you have to have a really good product as well? You Well, you need to have an excellent product. You know, many of our businesses are in the food sector. And I, and I always say because people in the Bay Area will eat anything or they'll try anything once. So you might be creating some new food that, you know, is unfamiliar to people or some delivery mechanism that's unfamiliar to people. But unless it's good, people aren't going to come back to you. So you're, you're, it's a very competitive market every place. So your your product has to be good and you have to be able to stand by it very firmly. And what do they need to do now to survive the current economic crisis? So this is really, it's, it's obviously just an unprecedented time and it's devastating for small businesses. The, um, you know, having that resiliency and connecting with that is very important. Think for businesses also to know this is happening everywhere. This isn't a fault of your own business. This is so much bigger than any of us right now. So it's not the time to say, I should have done this if my packaging were orange rather than yellow, if uh, I charge $2 less. Like, take all that away because this, this is really, really different. I think this can be a time for businesses to improve their online services, and Renaissance is doing some special training around that. How do you show up online? We have some businesses who have pivoted. One of our consignment stores is now selling online. She just had an online fashion show. So what? how can you get your customers to see you as an online business? I also suggest that small businesses reach out to their clients and just stay in touch. You know, there are a lot of people who aren't working who would welcome your email. They want to know what's happening with you. It, you know, write a newsletter. Write some information that, you know, will will be inspiring, that will just give them you know, some other way to ask a little bit more about your customers, get to know them a little bit better. Um, look at new delivery models. You see all the restaurants now have the takeout services. Well, you know, they, they pivoted to a model that they could use to survive right now. So really be open to new ways of operating and the 
you know, use this time to develop e-commerce that perhaps you never had before or increase your SEO and, and use this time to develop new financial plans or think through those new products and services that you, you know, may want to deliver in the future. So you have to be flexible and creative yes. about other yes. possible avenues for your business. Exactly. You also reminded me of the story in the paper about City Lights Bookstore, that it was able to raise over $300,000 mm-hmm. on GoFundMe yes. to keep its store open. So it must have had a strong customer base that it was able to tap into to do this reinforces the idea that you really need to be in touch with your customers and they need to know what's going on and they have to feel part of your community. Yes. And and I think right now uh, people in general are feeling, are, are really feeling the, the hardships that small businesses are going through and people are kind of developing a new mindset to, you know, walk down your corridor and see everything closed. And I think people are asking themselves the question, well, what's happening to our businesses and really want to help in some way. Some businesses are doing the crowdfunding like City Lights, which is brilliant. They've, of course, been around, so they're really well known. But but other businesses know their customers that well, too. I'm sure you know your local bakery or your dry cleaner, like these are people you talk to all the time. So it's really okay to do some kind of crowdfunding with them or gift certificates. You know, ask people to pay for services in advance, you know, buy a gift certificate, you know, or sell gift certificates for your your haircutting services that, you know, people know they're going to get when they can go outside. So see if there are different ways to capture that interest. Yes. So create the funds now by selling yeah. maybe at a discount so that you have the revenue flowing in. And then hopefully by the time they redeem those certificates, you have already generated other possible revenue. Right. So those are really good ideas. Do you see any potential opportunities for entrepreneurs at this time? Do you think there are actually new possibilities or um, opportunities that entrepreneurs should be looking at and saying, hey, I could be helping out or I can be making a difference? Well, I think some people have have made some switches that are, um, uh, we have a woman who makes these beautiful cashmere shawls and now she's making face masks. Um, We have a restaurant who needed to close and that woman is making face masks. Like there's something that's popped up really quickly I don't think that's a new business model, but that's a new product, and it's a way, again, of connecting with your customers. I think the the real opportunity is with online services and delivery options that um, uh, probably people always relied on customers to walk into their place of business, and that was a model that worked. So now are there delivery options, and if you do create online markets, can you take those online markets much broader than a customer base who would walk in and out? Perhaps you can, you know, promote them throughout the state or throughout the country. Like, there there might be ways to reach new people. Or make access easier. Yes, yes. Just, you know, it's a really great time to shop online at home, so... Are there ways that you can either deliver or use a delivery service, use the mail, depending on what the product is, to get into your customers' homes? Yes, and I think you you mentioned SEO, and I know that Google and Facebook, they're trying to help small businesses by giving them um, ad credits. And this is a time where you can really do outreach without spending money. Yes which is uh, it's actually there's opportunities to actually do more if you have the ability to. Right. And people are online more, so that's, it's really likely they're going to see what you're putting out there. Can you share the results of the Entrepreneur Tracker, the national survey sure. conducted by Aspen Institute's field program 
about the participants in the Renaissance yes. Entrepreneurship Program? Yes, this is a survey that we conduct annually, and it's a third-party survey. And about half of the people who come to Renaissance are in business, and the other half are not yet in business. Um, as I mentioned before, the ones who are in business are either uh, lightly in business, very new to business, or they've, they've hit a wall. They haven't made the profits they've expected to see. And then there's a small percentage who really wants to grow. But of the people who come to us not in business, over half, 54% start businesses. It's not for everyone. Everyone who walks into the, our doors with a business idea is not necessarily going to start because they might learn that it's not really for them or they won't make the kind of revenues they expect. And we actually think that's a success, you know, to not move forward if your idea isn't going to work. Um, of the people who start businesses, 50% have one to three employees. Most of our businesses are small businesses, and they they don't hire huge numbers of people. The restaurants that we work with are the exception, but for the most part, it's it's a small number of employees. We we also see that annual incomes after the first year are ninety seven thousand five hundred dollars. So that's an average, and for some people that compares to what they had earned making minimum wage even. So it's a big jump. Um, and overall, it's a 48% increase in household income. So if you look at what usually happens, maybe people are getting 3 or 5% raises. This is, this is a way to bring that way up um, and really change people's lives in a very short amount of time. And it's brilliant because they may not be able to do this if they go with the traditional job path of obtaining a low-paying job without a college degree or highly needed skills. Instead, they're creating their own income through something that they're learning. Absolutely. Right. With the guidance of Renaissance Entrepreneur Center, um, they're acquiring what they need to understand in order to make this happen. Yes. And they're also building an asset. You know, a business is an asset that you can pass down to future generations. It's something everyone in your family can be involved with. And it's, it's a legacy where we also see that people who start businesses have different roles in their communities. They're much more engaged. They're often looked at as community leaders. And they have a different role even in their families. And they're helping to create a community, right? They are. They are. Um, of the jobs that small business owners create, they they give chances to people. You know, so many people got their first start working in a small business. You know, they're giving the first job to someone. They are also hiring people who have been out of the workforce. So there's really an understanding and an openness that small businesses can provide. They usually can provide flexible hours, so that works for people who have family care obligations. And they're, they're willing to take a chance on people. We, uh, one of the populations we work with are formerly incarcerated people, and they will hire other formerly incarcerated people. And that's a population that has a very, very difficult time getting employed. And, you know, if, if, you yourself were formerly incarcerated, you're going to give other people opportunities. Yes, yes. And even though they've done their time, it's like they're paying forever if they try to enter yes. through the traditional job market. Yes. What are your top favorite success stories from the program? So um, we... You know, as I mentioned, we work with a lot of food businesses. Um, and in addition to the fact that people will eat everything, it's also often a very low capital barrier to entry. And, you know, who doesn't love food? So um, one, one of our great 
successes is Yvonne Hines. She runs Yvonne Southern Sweets in the Bayview. And she makes absolutely delicious butter cookies and pralines and other things. And Yvonne has been running this business for um, 15 years now. She came to Renaissance when she had just started, and we've, we've helped her along the way. She had her She was pregnant. She knew she needed to make more money for childcare. She started selling cookies, and it really took off. And it went from selling out of her car to having a bakery to, you know, we've watched her daughter grow up, and it's been wonderful to see. Her daughter is now 15, and, you know, her goal is to go to Stanford Law School, and She'll make it. You know, she's really, really exceptional, but she was able to really propel her life forward through her business. Um, another brand new business that we have is another food business, and they're in the Richmond, El Garage. And they had been working out of their home, and they were making Mexican food, and people were just lining up on the street in front of their home. They had the opportunity to rent a new space that's actually right next to our office in the Richmond, in Richmond rather. And they're, unfortunately their opening has been paused because of COVID, but they, they really had a great product. They saw that there was a huge market for the product and they then came to Renaissance and got all the backup business training and they will be able to launch very soon. How exciting. And um, we, we also work with a lot of construction businesses. And there, you know, there is a lot of work in construction in the Bay Area. There are goals to bring in low and income and minority contractors in the projects. But the uh, it, it hasn't been an easy connection to make. So we have a focus program working with the construction businesses. And we have um, painters that are highly successful. We have a janitorial company, and they are doing janitorial cleanup. They operate out of our Bayview Center. And what's really, really remarkable about our construction programs is most of them have a real commitment to being role models in the community and hiring locally. Like they want to say, I made it, so can you. And they're creating opportunities for those who wouldn't have them otherwise. Yes. And construction is a well-paying industry, so they're creating really quality jobs for people and giving them skills. So given all the years that you have worked with entrepreneurs, what would be your top five pieces of advice? Um, I would say, like, create that business plan. Like, it is so important to... Think through what you're doing, make the plans, and then launch. And so many entrepreneurs, like, have an idea, launch their business, and then figure it out. But if you really go through that process of planning before you launch, it will help you to think through the different possibilities, you know, really determine what your, you know, what the flow is, you know, what your operations are, what your management needs to be, what your marketing is. It's it's easy not to pay attention to things that you don't like so much, but if you're writing a business plan, you need to answer all those questions. So that plan is key. Um, as I mentioned before, like know your financials. You have to know them regardless what stage of business you're at. You really have to see what's happening financially in your business. Like, and three, I would say like love business. It's not enough to love your product or service. You have to really love the way it works and love making transactions with people recognizing that even though your own boss, your customers are really all of your boss. You know, you have to play all these different roles. You have to be comfortable with being the salesperson, being the CEO, and, you know, being the IT team when something breaks down. But you have to be excited by that business dynamic. 
you you also need to build network. Um, this is something that many people have the opportunity to build in graduate school, maybe through their neighborhoods when they get an MBA. Like there are different places that people build connections. With the entrepreneurs we're working with, they don't necessarily have that built-in community of role models and mentors. So build them, whether they're through classes you take, consultants you meet, um, any kind of other business owners. Make sure you have your team of support behind you. And, and finally, keep learning. Um, Renaissance offers the business planning classes, and then we have a host of workshops to help people to perfect their skills in different ways. And as you're learning, you might see new opportunities to pivot, and don't be afraid to pivot. There are products that made sense five years ago that may not make sense now. So be really open and keep your ear to the marketplace. And if something requires changing, don't be afraid to, to make that switch. And if you're not located in the Bay Area, I assume there are other nonprofits that would be able to, to be of help. Yes, there are. Um, there are. Renaissance is the San Francisco Business Center. There are other nonprofit organizations like Renaissance that operate throughout the country. And there's the SBDC, which is Small Business Development Centers. And there are several in every state. So these are also places that provide support and guidance to small business owners. And right now, Renaissance is offering all of our programs online, so people can join them from any place in the country. That's fantastic. Thank you for joining me on Spark today and sharing this information that's very valuable to so many people. Thank you.